Ready? Anything you would like to tell me, ask me, or, or request? Anything that you would like to, to see differently? Or is everything okay? Enjoying so far? All good? All good. Uh, I'm happy. I actually appreciate a lot that you're spending your time here uh, here with me. I understand that when, uh, when I was promoting the... Um, the workshop, it probably wasn't so much clear what is it going to be about, but for me, it's kind of important not to just give you uh, tooling tutorials, which I will give you as well, but uh, to, to somehow explain the context, the wider context, why, why do we do what we do and why should, um, uh, why should we care about all these uh, things and what does it bring and also um, how to distinguish between valuable and not so valuable thing, uh, things and how difficult it is to define uh, a problem. And uh, this is what, uh, what I will talk about uh, now uh, on the hands-on. I'll try to show you a couple of projects that, that uh, I did uh, before or I was part of. Um, um, and I'll try to explain what was what was the primary concern. Uh, this term primary concern also comes from uh, from Peter Eisenman. He is um, he says that um, when you are producing something, designing something, um, he talks about architecture, but this applies to to anything. When you are designing something, you need to con to take special care about one thing. Um, that is your primary concern. And you cannot really take all the aspects into consideration and it's difficult to, um, to fill all the expectations, ambitions. Uh, you should aspire for one thing and do one thing uh, properly and, and do everything else uh, so that that one thing is done well. Um, and I think this is actually a, a very good approach because uh, then, you, th then you actually have some sort of decision uh, tool you can you can decide better about certain things you know what what those certain things uh, are and how to achieve them well and if something else doesn't work perfectly then you don't care so much um, but you do one thing uh, or investigate one thing with your project properly um, it's not that in Architecture very often is understood as problem solving, but sometimes it's just uh, problem setting. Sometimes you just um, uh, try to, to discuss certain problem with, with uh, architecture and then that's the point where things are starting to be interesting. You basically, instead of giving a solution, you're asking a question and that's, uh, we actually, our, our uh, Biennale project was called Asking Architecture and, and uh, it was a collection of non-architectural projects that are asking architectural questions, very fundamental ones, what architecture is, what it should uh, deal with, um, how do you evaluate the architecture and so on. Um, anyway, um, I will show you uh, a couple of my projects where I will try to identify um, the primary concern. And uh, sometimes not all of these projects are I consider successful. Some of them are very old, but I would really like to show you what was the main thing that I was dealing with and what, uh, what personal gain it, it brought to me that I asked that question and I didn't care about anything else. Um, because when I, it's, when I try to uh, satisfy all the expectations, uh, I'm very unsuccessful with my design. Um, it's, it's almost a given that I'm always unsuccessful with my design when I try to satisfy all the expectations. If I don't try to satisfy all my expectations, there is a little chance that the design will be successful. It's not always, but at least it brings me somewhere else and it brings uh, certain questions and it maybe pushes the experience and, and opens a certain other motivations to, to investigate something uh, later on. Um, let me share my screen now. Um, like this, like this. Hope you already can see uh, my screen. 
All right, so uh, it's one, two, three, four, five uh, projects. I will go uh, quickly through them so, so that we are not longer than half an hour with this block. Um, and then we have a, a long break. Uh, the first one is incredibly old. It's from 2005 when I was still studying at my first university at the Technical University. And um, already th this, was, this was a breakthrough project for me uh, because at this project I realized that um, I want to investigate with architecture rather than uh, give solutions uh, for, for better um, results. Um, you can see it's old. Uh, the renderings are funny and uh, everything is... Uh, um, looks like a like a student work uh, and it's something that i usually don't show uh but even though i think i think there is a lot of uh, interesting stuff um you can see on the right part of the screen that that uh, it's a housing estate housing uh um development uh, that was built uh, built in late uh, designed in late 60s and built uh throughout 70s and 80s in in uh, bratislava capital of slovakia um and that's uh, those are panel uh, prefab uh, blocks of flats, uh, uh, just like anything that you can see in the eastern, in the former eastern block. And uh, the assignment was to develop a central part, which currently is a park, or um, just um, just there is a, a little river um, and nothing around, just meadows. And that was uh, already planned to, to be developed further, but it never happened. Um, with this project, which, uh, which was our student project um, with, with uh, um, two other collaborators, uh, Jana Stefan Stikova and, uh, and Tomasz Hal, uh, we, uh, we developed something like, like this, which is a completely messed up solution that is layered uh, vertically. And, and uh, there are so many things like, um, we, we had certain ideas. Now I really don't like having ideas when designing. I, I, I prefer developing certain uh, concepts and, and, and solutions uh, rather than having ideas. Because when you have an idea, it's just you, you, something come up to your mind and just, just apply it without any context. So we had a lot of ideas here. Like one of the ideas was that we should put uh, uh, terraced houses um, on, on a bridge and, and build a bridge of houses um, uh, 30 meters above ground here. And that we should put all the cars on, on bridges and people should still walk on, on the uh, ground level uh, on the meadows and let's not destroy the meadows and let's make uh, two stories, uh, two story high um, um, streets, like one street above another, or we can make uh, terraces and, and uh, little gardens in front of existing houses that, that are again, some sort of bridges and so on. So, so there's a lot of ideas, but uh, there's also one concept uh, and the reason why I'm showing you, uh, showing you and that's uh, the, the crucial part of, of this project for me, the primary concern, the, the one thing that I really wanted to investigate with this project and everything else was just a tool of investigating that one single thing. And I, I was trying to, that, you have to understand this is 2005. There is no grasshopper around. Uh, there is something called Rhino script, which uh, I didn't know at that time. I was uh, still not using Rhino. I was mainly using uh, 3ds Max. Uh, everything that you see is made in 3ds Max, uh, which was really an, um, an efficient tool for, for me to, to do what I wanted to do. But the primary concern here was that if you have certain landscapes like th this central picture uh, should demonstrate that well. You have certain fabric of urban fabric. I, I represented that with three um, horizontal layers of, of, of a mesh. And then you do something with those fabrics, you somehow intertwine them, and then you start putting some things inside of that fabric, like buildings. And because of their gravity, they change the landscape. So if you first, uh, let's look at this picture. There is a skyscraper here planned and it's not there yet. And if you just make an analysis of an existing structure, uh, there is nothing and there is nothing attractive. And because there is nothing attractive, you wouldn't probably place anything there. But once you place uh, the skyscraper there, it's got a huge gravity. It attracts uh, the crowd, it attracts all the other buildings around. So. So you completely change the conditions and suddenly there is a gravity and, and you somehow distort the, the existing fabric. And then you, then you put something else there 
because it's already an attractive place and you make it even more attractive and even um, the surroundings and so on. So let's have a look here. I'm trying to show here that it really matters uh, in which order you are placing uh, attractive things or distractive things into, um, into the fabric, into the landscape and it does something uh, to your design. So it does matter in which order you organize uh, and design things. And at that point, I, and that was my primary concern. And at that point, I realized that I don't really have a tool that allows me to do the, these things, that it doesn't really work that way I want because in 3ds Max, I, these were physical forces. This was a gravity force, but the gravity force could um, distort geometry, but it couldn't distort other gravity forces. So with one gravity force, I couldn't really move another gravity force. What I needed to do is a system that moves whenever I, I make a change into the system, the whole system, including forces that form the former version of the, of the system, change. And at this point, I really didn't know how to, how to call the, this thing, how to name that thing. But now I see that it's that complex system that I was talking about before. It's the emergent complex system that gives you, um, that, that works in iterations, that works in time. And if I'm placing things there while still in computer, I don't care if the skyscraper is actually moving. The skyscraper can move if it's in, inside of the computer. Only when it's built, it cannot move. But so, so my ideal, a design tool would be um, um, something where I put some something attractive or destructive and it completely reorganizes the rest of the system. And then I put something else and it again reorganizes the system. And whatever I'm putting in are some forces and the forces are not fixed. They can also be modified with other forces. So they influence each other um, in a way. And I didn't know how to name it at, at this point in my uh, studies. And this was my frustration where this is something that, that seemed very attractive to me, but I didn't get uh, the proper support except of one person who is also going to be the guest um, in one of my uh, uh, sessions um, when we talk about the unusual suspects. Uh, uh, his name is Ma Martin Uhrig and he's now teaching a studio uh, at the university there. Uh, somebody uh, switched on a microphone. I will switch off. If you want to speak, you can uh, just raise your hand and I will switch on your microphone and then you can speak. Um, uh, actually, I would actually like you to speak to make this a little bit more interactive. Uh, so um, now you're muted again. Um, anyway, so so um, this was already some proto um, complex system where things can influence, influence each other. And then I started, um, years later, I, I started uh, stud to, to study this thing. And I realized that what, what the, the issue that I had is called uh, a Leibniz uh, three body problem. And the problem is that uh, when you have uh, two gravitational bodies, uh, you can imagine it as a sun and, and, and earth. Um, the earth is attracted by the sun, but the sun is also somehow attracted uh, by the earth, uh, much, much less, but it is still attracted. So, so over time, they, they come closer to each other. And mathematically, it's quite easy to calculate how they are influencing each other when they are only two. Um, but when they are three, it's much more difficult and you cannot do it um, when you are making a static mathematical analysis. And to solve this problem, um, uh, Isaac Newton invented calculus, um, which basically um, makes a derivative, which is, which is a mathematical representation of a certain change. So instead of seeing systems as a static thing, you see it as something dynamic and you don't really care about absolute values, in, in this case, absolute positions, but you care about the change of the, those values. In other words, you care about how much something has moved. Uh, it's the same about the fish that I was explaining in a tank, uh, in an aquarium. When you have a still photograph of, of fish in a tank, you don't know if it's moving or not, but if you have a video or just two uh, slides, you already see the difference and the difference in the motion, that's what matters. You see if it's moving, if it's moving fast or slow, but if you are looking <clears throat> at a complex system, three body system as a, as a system of differences, then it's possible to calculate what happens next. And you can 
completely deterministically, you can you can make a simulation and see what happens next and how these uh, forces will influence each other. And it was not possible to do in 3ds Max in 2005. I don't know if it's possible now because I stopped using the, the software at that point because it stopped to be interesting for me. Um, but it wasn't possible because it was seeing geometry as something that is static, that doesn't work over time. Um, I'm pretty sure this is this is perfectly doable in Houdini. I know how to do it in Grasshopper now, and I do it a lot. Um, but it doesn't really matter about the, the tool doesn't matter so much. What matters to me is that that the notion of something that of a system that, where every element influences any other element, and that you can only simulate that. You cannot really expect that. That's what is interesting. That's where the emergence come, uh, come, comes up. And that's what, what was the primary concern here. And I still wasn't able to name it at that point, but I was able to, to, to think about it. And basically the, the scheme that you are looking at now is the reason why I even started to investigate the theory of computational design. And that's why I still do that uh, 15 years later. Um, Another project uh, the next year, um, I'm telling everybody that my diploma project, I, I, I did two diploma projects on two different schools in Microsoft Excel um, uh, in the spreadsheet editor. So if you, if you look closer, oh, if you look closer here, uh, let's see, no, there is no chat. Um, I, will, I will try to zoom in uh, so that you can actually see it. Uh, this is made entirely in, in Excel. Um, so this is, basically a spreadsheet. Numbers, colors, and uh, here as well. So what I was doing here is, um, uh, this is not so interesting in, um, to explain in detail, but um, the assignment was to make a vertical landscape, uh, basically to read, to, to look at an existing part of a city and do something that will have that will have similar qualities, but it's it's vertical. The thing is that when when you uh, analyze uh, something that is a landscape, it's basically two dimensional. Um, it's not entirely true, but well, mostly two dimensional or two and a half dimensional. But my my, my concern was to bring that into three dimensions. So so you can not only, well, you don't have neighbors only to the left, to the right, to the front and to the back, but also above and below. So it's three dimensional. And in this project, the primary concern was the big data. I, I, I decided to analyze big data. So um, I collected some data from, from a two dimensional landscape. The data was about the topology that I changed from, from uh, a topographical map into uh, a simplified topological map. You can see here, which is a, a, just a representation um, of, of the same thing. Then I analyzed the neighbors. So I, I, I collected some data about each of the cells and then I made a comparison to the neighbors. So, so these spreadsheets, these tables of data that are, uh, they are not only telling about uh, talking about the qualities of each of the elements and cells, but also about about the differences between the cell itself and its neighbors. So we are already pretty close to to the calculus, to the complex system, and to the understanding that what matters is not the value itself, but the difference of the values that are close to each other. So not that thing itself, but what, how does it differ from something that is next to it. At this point still, I didn't know that what, what I'm trying to achieve is, is, a, is a very um, hot topic of the computational design. Um, mainly at that time, again, Greg Lynn, um, maybe before, um, I didn't know because I didn't read that much because, because there was no um, notion of reading uh, at the university where I was, I was studying, that it was all about just producing. If I knew, maybe I would do it uh, better or differently. Uh, but still, I collected or, uh, a lot of data, then I generated automatically a lot of uh, data, which is the differential data. <clears throat> and based on that differential data, I was placing, placing some cells into uh, some envelope that um, I actually think that it was a kind of a smart, a smart approach because I had some, some potentials. These are the potentials where certain things could be based on their uh, properties and based on the properties of its neighbors. Um, and I was placing uh, elements to that envelope. 
and when I did it the first time, the potentials have changed. And then I, I, I did have a different map of potential locations of certain uh, elements of the system. And then I could do it again and again and again. And the system was stabilizing, which was a surprise for me because it works really well, uh, worked really well. I eventually came up with um, a configuration, a spatial configuration that was kind of stable and I was able to replicate um, the neighborship co um, conditions that um, the neighborhood conditions that, that I uh, read from a map and I was able to apply to uh, to, to, to a vertical system where there, there are no not only four but six neighbors and, and the neighborhood um, connections were um, very similar and again it was it was working iteratively so not only big data but also iterative approach to to uh, data processing and some some sort of stabilizing of, of a system over time repeating the the same uh, stuff with um, more and more updated data. Uh, I see that somebody commented something. Let's let's see, uh, let's see the chat. Um, I just don't know where the chat window is. Let me let me, let me see. Uh, is it this one? No, no, no. Um, yeah, there is the chat. Mm. Is the data visualization uh, made uh, in Grasso pro or processing? Uh, no, it's entirely made in Microsoft Excel. It's like this Excel. Um, where is it? Where is it? Here. Yeah, it's entirely made here. All the pictures that you see are made here, uh, except except the schemes that uh, at that time I made in Corel Draw. So um, and also the the Excel uh, you can you can uh, write scripts uh, scripts for the Excel and and that's very good because um, it was really calculating on its own and at that time I had a very slow computer because my main computer was broken and uh, I was struggling with that and uh, it took overnight to to calculate one iteration of this skyscraper so what you see was about a week of calculations and it actually generated um, these are. Um, these are uh, sections here. Um, oh, wait, I will zoom in. These are vertical sections uh, like this. What you see here are vertical sections. And I made vertical sections in one direction, vertical sections in uh, the orthogonal direction. And these are horizontal sections as well. So these are basically plans. And that was entirely um, um, made in Excel. Uh, because it's it was kind of easy for me to to uh, do the programming, but what what you see here is basically uh, a voxel system that uh, Mario Carpo is now talking about uh, a lot, and and well, um, it makes sense to to use voxels, and I think in two thousand six people were using voxels already. I'm not really sure, but uh, I used Excel because it it had a like a physical representation of the discrete. Uh, voxel system that I needed and I could input a lot of information. So I had a lot of spreadsheets where I manually inserted numbers and just imagine like something like this. This is again a spreadsheet where I was giving certain cells certain values and I had a lot of spreadsheets. One, one was talking about, I, I don't know, um, uh, how much sunlight is on each of the cells. The other one was how much uh, noise was there. Uh, the other one was how dense they are. And I could actually use the spreadsheet spreadsheets to actually um, input data onto, onto cells. And that was very useful to, to use uh, Excel for that. And then I made the, the program that was actually reading all of this data and writing it to other spreadsheet and so on. And, that, and then I um, printed uh, PDFs out of that. And then I made up like a 3D visualization, which is, which is this part. Um, and it actually had a, uh, like a physical representation. There was uh, actually a design uh, at the end. I'm not showing that because it doesn't really look so good. But eventually I ended up with something that looks like a blobby, um, um, some, something that looks like a, a, a blobby thing from nature. Anyway, let's go to, uh, to, to the next project, which is, uh, which is the jewelry that I was showing you in the, in the previous part. Um, um, 
that's uh, that's a project that we called misbehaved because it was all about behavioral um, analysis. Um, uh, we, we, we were three people doing that, uh, myself, Maciej Hopan, uh, who was working with us at that time, and Tomasz Told, who is still working with me. Um, and we, we just took all the tools that we had in Grasshopper, and you see this is 10 years later. Um, this is after I made the Boyd library that I will show you uh, later on today uh, for simulations. And we wanted to, to bring the simulations into the material world uh, somehow. And this was one of the... Um, uh, easiest way of uh, implementing that, uh, just making jewelry, not because we would like to make jewelry, but because it's something that you can actually produce um, pretty fast and, and efficiently. So um, what you see here uh, is a simulation of a flock. Uh, if you remember, well, I will show you, if you uh, look at this picture, so uh, this is a simulation of ants uh, looking for food. It's called Stigmergy. And here, this part, if you chop here and here, try to remember, chop here and here, whatever remains in between is, um, let's go here, is this. So it's just uh, just one part of that bigger thing. So this is this is something that comes from when you materialize and stabilize uh, the, the the traces, the paths of of the ants that I was simulating uh, at that time. Uh, this is something that Tomas made. Um, this is a bracelet, and again, there is there are certain simulations of ants moving. And the primary concern he concern here is um, it was. A technical motivation. We we had all these pictures in the computer, and we didn't know how else to bring it in the, into the real world. Because when you have a photograph, this is a photo. This is not a rendering. Um, when you have a photo, it it has a different value. You actually made a prototype. You actually made something that is real and then that can be um, tangible. You you can hold it, and you can use it somehow. And that was we we had strictly a technical motivation. Can we actually produce it in real life? And we managed, we, we did, and we do have, and I will show you now, um, I will just um, just do one thing. Um, I will take this camera and uh, let's see. Um, how can we do this? Nope. Uh, oh, it's not. It's not possible anymore. Uh, all right, uh, so I will show you like this. So I've got the jewelry here, and you see that we actually did 3D print that thing. So what what you see in the in the presentation, I will actually stop my screen sharing so that you can see it on a on a bigger scale. So what you what you saw in the in the presentation. That's this thing. It's kind of heavy because it's made of uh, stainless steel. It's metal. And um, the ring that I was showing you before is it's this one. Um, and uh, there is a lot of other um, pieces as well. Uh, that, that chopped thing, it's, it's this small and it's got all the details. Mm. So we were trying to achieve to, to bring that in, in reality uh, in high detail. And we, we really did want to know how difficult it is to, to actually produce the designs that we, that we were making uh, for years in computer. And this is something that we do uh, at the office now uh, very often because as Andrea Graziano says, uh, you need to prototype or, or die. Um, it's very hard to, to make the virtual versions of the designs. It, it's not easy to design something like like uh, like this, something that, that I'm showing to you. It's, it's at least not easy for us. Uh, I believe that for some people it might be. It was not easy for us to design something like that. But then uh, to, to make it real, it's, it's a completely different level of a problem. Um, it's super complicated to, to actually build something like this. And um, that's why we do prototype a lot. Um, I will. Uh, I can I can show you there is something hanging on the wall. Um, I know th I know that I'm just sharing my screen now. I was again stop sharing the screen, and I will show you here at the office. Um, just just one one little one little thing. I will switch uh, from here 
like that. So, uh, hope you can still hear me. <clears throat> I will I will show you this project. This is something that uh, that's another prototype of another project that we will show you later on uh, on a sub digital day. But the thing is that um, when this is in the computer, it looks like something that is fairly simple. It's not it's not a complicated thing in the computer. But if you are supposed to make it in real life, it's so difficult to put everything together to to be sure that you are like physically able to to assemble these things to to do all the all the manual labor that that is needed for for the computational design to become real um, that we also have projects that the main the primary concern the the motivation behind is purely technical. We only care about um, the technology of production, even though, and, and, and therefore we lower the standard of, of uh, the um, design novelty. We, we still care about the design. It should look good. It should uh, work well and, and so on. So we still have expectations about the design, but the ambition uh, when it comes to the formal complexity um, is lower than with other projects because our primary concern is to test whether we can do that. And if we know that we can, um, uh, if we know that we can, then we know that in the next project we can rely on that um, experience and we can push things further. There's a question, are these kind of systems uh, that you test, uh, that, that you test it and predict the result uh, form? Um, I guess you are still asking about uh, the um, you are still asking about the jewelry. Uh, that's the thing that th that's exactly the design where we didn't know what the result uh, form is going to be. Um, there's I can I can show you in the presentation because it's you can see it better than uh, on the camera um, with uh, the ring, the small ring that uh, I was showing here. <clears throat> uh, this was. Actually, the only thing that I knew at the beginning was uh, that it should be a ring. So I made a circle in Grasshopper, and then I started a simulation of a flock um, floating around that circle. And the flock was made of um, an even number of parts. Let's say just two particles, two, two agents, but they were more. But let's talk about two. And each one of them was, was going different direction. And there were forces that somehow they should interact and somehow synchronize. And they, they went around the circle, one clockwise, one uh, counterclockwise. And at a certain moment, they, they met and their mutual forces were so strong that they started to influence each other so much that they stopped orbiting the circle um, in this direction, and they both started orbiting in the perpendicular uh, direction, and they created these two um, uh, parts that looked like uh, headphones or like a little ornament on the ring, and that was absolutely not planned. That, that's something that happened out of the behavior. We didn't know upfront that this is really, I, I didn't know that this is going to happen. And um, yeah, I'll, well, well this, is, this is a completely emergent design that this part of the ring that happened and there was no plan for, for that. But I know exactly why did it happen. So it's completely deterministic. I know uh, the forces behind, but I didn't know it's going to happen. Um, for me, that there is like a side story. Uh, this was supposed to be an engagement ring that my, a friend of mine asked me to, to, to make. And um, then I made a, a story around it that um, this is like two people just uh, living in the world, orbiting each other. And when they finally meet, they, start, they, they synchronize their lives and they, they start moving together. And that's like, um, yeah, he liked it very much, but they didn't get married after all. And he never proposed. No. Um, anyway, um, so uh, that was just a, just a side story. Uh, there is a question here in the chat. Uh, yeah. Um, Thanks for explaining. Yeah. Uh, there is, uh, I, I just want to show you what the primary concern and motivation can be. Uh, let's go back to that system. Uh, this is something that I did uh, last year and I was struggling with this project uh, a lot because it was a real assignment from, from a client. He wanted something completely different, but, but I came up with this. Um, 
uh, the assignment was to create some tank uh, for uh, coffee beans in, into a coffee shop. So, so when uh, a customer comes to a coffee shop, uh, he or she can can uh, actually um, uh, collect or or like they take the coffee beans themselves and and then um, they will pay for that and they, they could choose from different coffees. Um, Oh, so somebody said sad story, but it's a good concept. Actually, it's not a sad story. They they they've got really nice. Uh, um, uh, she got married to somebody else, and they 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 are perfect together. And uh, he's he's also kind of happy. Anyway, um, so back to this uh, back to this story. Uh, this this was this was a sad story actually because I was struggling with the assignment from the client, and I just um, I, I was never that much stuck in my in my life like like I was with that project. And look completely different. I was designing some 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 tanks that the client wanted, and maybe now now when when I said that I'm I'm trying to listen to a lot of lectures, uh, one of the things that the Patrick Schumacher was was saying uh, is that when when the client comes to tell you that how your uh, design should look, you're saying like if the client comes and says it should look like a dragon. Uh, then it's not architecture, and you shouldn't be doing that because it's it's not architecture. So uh, the client came and told me it should look something like something uh, like like a tank, and I was trying to to come up with a solution, and and none of us was happy. Uh, then I said, okay, I, I'm not just I'm just doing something completely different, and this is what what I came up with. So these are pipes that can contain the coffee beans, and the pipes are continuous, and and um, and anyway. So, so the idea was to create a, a lot of spaghetti-like um, pipes, but at the same time, it should be possible to produce because this is something that we do in our office. This is um, that's one of the things that differs from from the research that we make and from the from the actual proposals. Uh, it should be critical in a, in a way that what we do at the office, but also we should always be sure that we can produce what we are proposing. So this is something that that was supposed to be um, produced, and I knew it it should look exactly like this, but then um, I had to come up with a technical solution how to how to actually build this. Um, but the primary concern was aesthetical. I I didn't want to compromise the aesthetics with the with the technology behind. So you you, you see here um, how it should look, and I came up with a technical solution that. Um, Eventually, I only had four types of pipes, a straight pipe, which is made of glass, and, and curved pa a pipe, um, and they are three different sizes because of reasons, <laughs> that doesn't matter. And then there are clamps that hold the, the whole thing together, and it's an aggregate, it's an aggregated structure out of these four elements, um, and they it holds together, but it's also um, following the, um, uh, the emergent system. So this is again some sort of a simulation uh, of, of a flock, it, even though it doesn't look like that. But you can make sure that each pipe that starts here uh, also ends on the bottom, where you can actually uh, take the coffee beans out. Um, but see that there is there is a primary concern, and I didn't want to compromise that primary concern. And everything should be um, should should happen uh, only because of the primary concern. Uh, this project also was never realized uh, because uh, the client eventually didn't like it. But um, it's good because we already have some design and at a certain point we, we are going to make a prototype out of that and maybe we can uh, develop it further. And it brought a lot of uh, questions and also uh, a lot of experience. Um, and there is, um, uh, I think this is the last uh, slide that I have um, or the last project that I would like to talk about. And it's um, when your primary concern or the motivation um, is the um, is a weight of production, which means it's not really the production process itself, but um, in general, um, we got um, a robotic arm in uh, 2015 or 14. I'm not really sure. Uh, it's a KUKA robot, which is which is which was amazing for us because um, it is placed at the university, but it doesn't really belong to the university. It, it belongs to our uh, research platform, which is which basically means that this robot is accessible to us anytime we want, and we are the only ones uh, using the robot. 
Um, and we decided to, to organize a couple of events where we invited um, smart people to actually help us uh, research the possibilities of the robot. And um, what you're looking at is a project made by, by uh, mainly Matur Zvierzycki. We, we organized a workshop where uh, people were coming for, um, to, to, to join the, the main tutor uh, with the research. So the tutor was not really teaching, but uh, there was a group of uh, students or participants who actually uh, developed the project further. What you're looking at is uh, 3D printing on a curved surface that we did in 2015. I think um, uh, there are more famous versions of this and some of them are uh, made much, much later than that. Some of them are before the, the MIT scanner Tibbetts uh, was doing that much uh, longer before us. But then I don't know about anyone else and then uh, many people did it again. Um, anyway, so uh, but the idea here is that we should think about designs that wouldn't be possible to be produced without having the robots. And this is the primary concern. This is the motivation. And that, and that is so complicated that I can now say that after five years, I don't know what could that be, that you can produce only with a robot and not in a different way. Uh, the only thing that I can imagine is that uh, the robot can uh, interact in real time uh, with whatever it's producing. When, when you have no uh, sense of, or no idea of, uh, of the result, just like with the emergent design, but the robot has certain behaviors and it produces something based on real time evaluation and the robot itself doesn't even know when there is no virtual model of what the robot is actually doing. Then um, that's something that uh, the robot can do for you as a, as a designer, something that you wouldn't be able to do without the robot. But unfortunately the robot we have doesn't allow for that. And um, what I do as, uh, as my PhD research, I, I do a couple of things. And one of the things is that I, I want to make the robot uh, behave interactively and interact with whatever it is producing to actually come up with uh, things that wouldn't be possible to design without the robot. Um, <clears throat> there was one thing that we were trying though with the robot and that's, um, well, we, we organized, uh, I think six or seven workshops like this um, where somebody came and, and worked uh, with the robot trying to figure out. <clears throat> um, the question is, could you uh, talk about uh, a little bit uh, the, the, uh, about the end effector, yes. Uh, the end effector that we have here, uh, uh, we actually, <clears throat> maybe I have got it here somewhere in the office, I'm not really sure, oh, never mind. Um, <clears throat> we decided to have uh, a round um, platform where we can uh, attach any end effector. This one is basically a 3D printer. We took a 3D printer from, uh, I think Zmorph, um, it's, a, it's a Polish company. So, so this is basically a 3D printer that is attached to a robot um, uh, instead of the CNC uh, to the three-dimensional uh, uh, axis. This is this is um, on the uh, on the robot, and basically it's um, it's just an ordinary uh, 3D printer with a very thick nozzle. Uh, that's the one. We also have a lot of other end effectors. Um, uh, the one that we use the most is is, is a poker. It's it's like it's um. It's, 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 a, it's a pen or, or something, a sharp object that can poke. Uh, we, we use that a lot. Um, we, we've got a pen, um, what you can see on, on, on the door uh, behind me, that's a painting made, uh, made by the robot of Imre Vashku, who is uh, my professor and um, he will be a guest. Um, so we've got a painting by the robot. Uh, then we have um, a wire cutter, a hot wire, which is this one. Uh, it doesn't look very attractive, but it's very efficient. So um, we can attach the hot wire on the robot and cut a styrofoam, which we were doing here, or we can uh, put the, the hot wire uh, fixed somewhere and uh, move the styrofoam with the robot um, to make the cuts. Uh, and then we have uh, with uh, Stuart Mags, uh, he made a, a wax dripper. So uh, his idea was to to 3D print something that when you're not happy with it, you just uh, out of wax. When you're not happy with it, you just melt the wax again and, and do something else. You just mm -hmm. drape it. So, so you can reuse the, uh, the printing material. So we've got a wax dripper. 
which turned out not to work so well, uh, but, but that's good because uh, that's why we do the experiments. And I don't know, we probably have some other effectors. I just cannot think of, uh, of those. We attached, um, we were developing photographs with a, with a robot with a fork. Uh, we uh, we put some light on, on, on the robot. We went to, um, uh, with Giorgio Castellano, we went to, to Tuscany a couple of years ago and on a, on a Renaissance square in, in, in Tuscany town. Uh, uh, we, uh, of Volterra, we, we just brought the robot there uh, in, in the public and we were weaving with some, some uh, weaving effector um, that was a project with uh, uh, Giorgio, uh, Tomasz Told and Jan Patzold. Um, and uh, I think that's, that's basically it. Um, and here I, I just wanted to show you um, one thing that we wanted to, to do as a plan. Um, we wanted to make some interlocking cuts of the styrofoam. Um, even, even the thing that I'm showing you right now, like fingers, uh, one of the workshops with um, Adrian Klingley and, and um, Kasper Radziszewski from, from Poland, they, they actually uh, cut like finger-like structure uh, uh, out of styrofoam and, and they were put, assembling it together. But I wanted to, uh, what you can see on the slide here, uh, I wanted to uh, create cuts that, um, that, that, that are interlocking and somehow organizing uh, the styrofoam pieces uh, the, the way I want. So, so something that th there is this piece and there should be a counter piece. And when you put them together, they lock and also they create a shape together that, that um, is uh, desired. But uh, eventually I didn't manage. It's um, robotic um, fabrication seems to be for us at least, it seems to be something so uh, unaccessible, even though we can use the robot anytime we want. Um, it's so complicated and slow that, that we somehow gave up. And uh, if you look at the lineup for, for this workshop, uh, there, was, um, there was one robotic day planned, the last one, uh, I, and I originally said it's uh, optional and I decided to skip it. Um, and one of the, one of the um, uh, questions there, or one of the topics is, why don't we use the robot anymore? Uh, and that's actually true. We don't use the robot because it's incredibly slow. This one is incredibly slow, not, not when it comes to the motion, but it's a very old version and we need to use floppy disks, the, the, the ancient magnetic floppy disks to actually copy the program to the robot, place it there, and then, then play the program. Super slow, super inefficient. And also this robot is kind of big and kind of dangerous. Unlike the new um, uh, collaborative robots that are almost safe um, that we use in Prague at Umpro. Uh, that, that's uh, a different story, but um, that is much easier to use. And there I'm developing an interface where you can interact with the robot uh, in real time, or basically the robot can interact with uh, whatever it is um, fabricating. All right, um, this, is the, this is it for this block. If you have any, um, uh, there is a question. Did you use uh, liquid material like concrete or clay with robotic arm? We did use the, the wax. We melted, uh, it was a paraffin, uh, the, the material that the modern uh, candles are made of. We, we bought a huge block of paraffin. Um, it was, it was a, um, a workshop with Stuart Max. Um, and he was melting the paraffin there and he had a solenoid uh, ripper and he was ripping the paraffin, but eventually uh, it was too liquid. Uh, and um, it didn't it didn't get stiff fast enough. So basically, whatever it, it, they were three D printing uh, with the uh, with the robotic arm, it was completely um, like melted. It, it just created like a little hill. Um, but also, it was a very nice um, uh, experiment because it showed that he his his idea was to reuse the material, which is which is super smart. And it showed that um, we would have to think about the uh, outside environment uh, to to cool things, to cool the material down, and how how difficult it is to uh, to work even in uh, in the lab conditions. Uh, not speaking of of, of real life uh, construction sites, so so it's obvious for me now that bringing robots to a construction site um, that's that's a far future because. 
even if we are not really able to control it well in, in a lab, then it's very far away from, from being in practice. What do you uh, uh, pay attention to when designing an uh, end effector? <clears throat> we, we don't really build the, the project around the end effector. We, we come up with some experiment that we want to make and then um, we, we make the, the end effector. Um, uh, the, the thing with our robot is that um, our end effectors are kind of dumb. They, they, don't, they are not smart devices, which would be super nice to have. If, the, if the, the end effector had some logic in it and if it could control the arm or at least give some information to the arm, that would be awesome. This is not really possible with our robot. Um, but when we design the end effector, we try to, to make it useful for, for the primary concern. So the primary concern usually is not the end effector. It's, it's um, uh, the pr production process that, that is somehow nonlinear. Actually, I, I haven't explained that uh, term. Uh, the nonlinearity that comes from uh, Manuel de Landa from, from um, his uh, writings. He's got a book called uh, 1000 Years of Nonlinear um, History. And he's basically, uh, the, the whole idea is about that when you, when you divide some process into, into time splits and to you know, split them into time, um, time moments, and each time, uh, you can bifurcate. You can either go to the right or to the left. You can you can make a decision uh, in any time moment, and um, because of that, when you are looking back, you know what path you took. But if you're looking uh, forward, you cannot expect uh, what the result is going to be because in every single time moment, you can you can go either to the right or to the left. And this is the nonlinearity that that we are uh, interested. In, uh, with robotic fabrication, that the robot actually can make decisions while producing something. And therefore, the result is nonlinear, which means the, the process is nonlinear. We, we don't have expectation. We cannot really predict what is it going to be. And therefore, it's um, kind of emergent. I don't know if I answered your, uh, your question, but we don't really focus that much on the end effectors, even though we could. Thank you too. Uh, all right, um, let's take a break, three hours now, because uh, there are other lectures uh, given by somebody else. I, I don't know the schedule, but uh, maybe you could watch the, the main uh, keynotes. And then we'll come back and uh, in three hours, I will uh, give you a tutorial in Grasshopper. So if you can, uh, please install, uh, install Rhino, install Grasshopper, well, that's part of Rhino, and install a plugin called Anemone. Um, I will write it down. Um, uh, so it's called, and you will find it um, in uh, uh, for Rhino. I will actually send you a link. Uh, it's a plugin made by uh, Mateusz Wierski, um, and it allows for uh, for looping in in Grasshopper. And I will show you some some things with loops. And basically, I will explain how to achieve some sort of. Um, um, uh, some sort of um, emergency, uh, even with a tool like like Grasshopper. This is not a a very basic tutorial. This is uh, this is slightly advanced. But even if you are if you don't have experience with uh, Grasshopper, I will try to make it um, understandable at least to so that you understand the concepts so well, because um, this is more about the concept than than about um, um, like learning step-by-step uh, step how to achieve something because I don't really have uh, any specific uh, result on mind. I just want to show you, show you some principles and how to think about um, stuff. Somebody on Facebook comment, uh, on, on YouTube commented, I had not heard of floppy disk for 20 years. That's true. Uh, we had a problem to even buy those uh, and we had a problem to buy um, a floppy disk drive that, that we could use with uh, the contemporary um, computers. Uh, that's some, yeah, that's the problem. Uh, we have to use that with uh, our robot. 
And inside of the robot controller, it's it's a huge cupboard. It's like two meters tall and, and heavy and stuff. All the new robots, they have the controller, which is a super small computer. Um, this one is huge. It's got all the electric wires there. It's super thick. I'm, I'm worried that it will kill me some one day with the electricity. And um, there is a computer inside. And it's, a, it's, a, it's an ordinary PC from the 90s. And I remember like, exactly. So, so we opened the, the PC and it didn't have, uh, it runs Windows XP. So it's not from the 90s, it must be the 2000s. Um, but anyway, there's a, there's a Windows XP, uh, there's a hard drive and, and, and all, all these things. And we were upgrading that. So we were looking for ancient uh, RAM modules and, and hard drives to, to work with the computer. So, so, so that it's not so slow. But still, we couldn't replace the, the floppy drive because it otherwise wouldn't work because the KUKA controller is so closed. It's a, it's a closed system. Anyway, um, we got fed up with the, with the robot and we're not using it anymore, therefore. But even though we are super happy that we got it and um, it served its purpose, we made a lot of workshops uh, with a lot of interesting people who actually uh, came up with uh, many interesting ideas. All right. Um, any more questions? Anything that you would like to discuss? If not, then uh, let's see each other in three hours. And thank you for, for uh, the patience. <laughs>